So hello to everyone. Uh, we are here for a new uh, EasySEM eChat and have a great pleasure and honor today to host um, a colleague, but also a friend of mine, Niklas Nielsen from Sweden. Hi, Niklas. Thank you, uh, Fabio. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, Niklas, uh, um, I would like you to uh, summarize for our audience the results of the TTM2 study just released on New England Journal of Medicine, please. Yes, uh, we released this uh, yesterday together with uh, New England, and uh, it is basically a cardiac uh, arrest trial uh, where we have uh, included patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest of a presumed cardiac cause or an unknown cause, but that was a small group. And uh, we included 1,900 patients in uh, 14 countries and 61 hospitals, so it was a bit of a multi-center trial. Um, and basically, we tried to have the concept from the Haka trial from almost 20 years ago, where we cooled down to 33 degrees in one group as rapidly as possible uh, with the standards of today. And we compared that to a group where we only followed temperature. Uh, and if this uh, patient group came to a target above 37.7, which we defined as fever, um, then we started temperature management in that group. And um, the results, uh, the main, uh, the primary outcome was uh, uh, mortality at six months, and we could not demonstrate any difference in, uh, in that aspect. It was very uh, similar. 50% had died in the hypothermia group at six months and 48% in the normothermia group. And it was also consistent throughout subgroups and uh, when it came to neurological outcome, which was our main secondary outcome. So it's in a essence, very neutral results. Very neutral results, as you said. Um, how we, how do you, do you, um came out with the idea of TTM2, because as you said, in the guidelines TTM with different characteristics is still recommended. How you came out with the idea, the group came out with the idea to compare with a group almost without no intervention. Actually, this was the idea already uh, before the TTM1 trial uh, in 2010, uh, based on the appreciation of the evidence at that time we thought that hypothermia for cardiac arrest was not uh, clearly demonstrated as beneficial based on uh, trials with some uncertainty. Um, so we wanted to do that trial already in 2010, compare 33 degrees with normothermia. But at that time, it was difficult to, to have hospitals in that trial because everyone was used to, to uh, issuing targeted temperature management. Um, so then we compared two levels of uh, hypothermia instead. But this time, after the neutral results of the TTM1 trial, we thought it, the time was uh, ready uh, for doing the more definite trial to compare normothermia with hypothermia. And also, the if you look at the, the clinical um, reality today, it's a big variation uh, between countries, between regions, between hospitals, and also within hospitals, if you are cooled, if you're not cooled, if you're cooled to 33, if you're cooled to 36, or something in between. So we wanted to have more solid evidence for this group. Nicholas, you mentioned a few times the ACA trial, which was the first one together with the Bernard trial to show that TTM could make a difference in the outcome of cardiac arrest patients. I would like to ask your interpretation, how do we change from the so huge differences in outcome in 2002, when the studies were published, to these very neutral results, very similar to the groups now in 2021? Yeah, it's of course uh, impossible to answer that question, uh, uh, but I can, I can only think that there are quite a number of possible reasons. Uh, one, it's 25 years after uh, the first trials were performed. They were performed in the 90s in a 
totally different ICU situation, uh, different aspects of care and uh, neurological prognostication, and withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies. Um, and uh, you can also say that both of these trials were quite small. And we know again and again, we see that the larger trials have more robust uh, estimates of effect. Um, it's possible that smaller trials can give spurious findings that cannot be replicated when they, the larger trials are performed. So I think you could look at those trials as uh, some kind of, um, um, what to say, stage two trials. And now we go to a or phase two trials. And now we go to a phase three trial. Uh, how does this uh, work in clinical practice in a large population? Then there may be numerous other differences. Uh, we have tried to minimize bias in every aspect. And that could also be a possible reason. You also mentioned another important point clinical practice. I remember when TTM1 was uh, published and released, many colleagues decided to stop controlling temperature. I remember one of your letters with Hans Freiberg and others in response to New England saying that the TTM study didn't show that people had to stop to do TTM, but just was a, a dose of TTM should be used. So you already um, uh, thought at the moment that people could misinterpret the conclusion of TTM1. So my point with you is that if you want now to explain to a colleagues practically, how you, would you translate the results of TTM2 in their practice? What would be your recommendation? What people should do in an out of hospital cardiac arrest comatose patients with, who would arrive at the hospital with the criteria, uh, let's say similar to patients including TTM2? Yeah, I would say that it's reasonable to adopt the upper arm, the normothermia arm of the TTM2 trial. And that is what we plan to do in our hospital system here in Sweden. Um, I think that's a reasonable conclusion of the trial because it's easier. Uh, it's less resource intensive. You can concentrate your care on other aspects uh, of the cardiac arrest that might be more important. Uh, so I think that is one uh, interpretation but we also have to have in mind that we actually do not know if the intervention that we gave in the TTM2 trial upper arm is beneficial or not we treated fever when fever uh, appeared but that is far from proven if that is something that is good for the patients harmful for the patients or clearly has no effect at all it might be an epiphenomenon so so, so, so so as of now, I would recommend doing what we did in the TTM2 trial upper arm, uh, but we should continue uh, investigating this area. I hope that people will listen to your words that you clearly mentioned that you would apply the intervention, the, sorry, the, the normothermia arm, which is very well described into the manuscript. And so people should apply that protocol rather than doing nothing for the moment. So um, do you think that, of course, you are very well-known methodologist also because you applied a very good methodology to the study. My question is, as a clinician, do you think that there is a space for individualized care, at least not only based on the results of randomized clinical trial, but do you still feel that there might be patient population who might benefit for a lower body temperature? Or you think that that is just a matter of no effect, whatever will be the characteristics of the patients. Uh, this is a little bit of the holy grail for all aspects of healthcare. Try to get the best uh, possible treatment for the individual patient. But as it has been shown in uh, numerous trials, uh, it is difficult to define that group. Uh, I think that we have to rely uh, on the bigger groups and the estimates and try to do what is best for the population. Of course, if we can find a gene or a blood test that indicate that this therapy would be very uh, useful for this individual patient, we should of course apply. 
but um, I think that is difficult at the stage that we are right now. There are no indications in any direction in the material we have that it's better or worse for this group or that group. So as of now, I think we should be cautious to, to individualize too much. I understand. My last question, of course, TTM2 has just been released. So people now need to di digest it. And I presume that many uh, subgroup analysis will came out trying to better uh, clarify or characterize what the results could be applied to different patients' populations or whatever. Now, maybe I'm, I'm too much uh, in advance, but my question would be, do you have already in your mind a TTM3 study? What would be, in your opinion, the aspect of TTM that still need to be studied in the future? Uh, I think uh, my perspective is uh, treatments delivered at the ICU. So it's the after the cardiac arrest and the, the event has already happened. So in that aspect, I think we need to clarify if temperature management at all, fever management, lowering a little bit is benefit, beneficial compared to doing nothing really when it comes to temperature. We still don't have that answer. So I think that is a crucial part of TTM3. Um, then of course, if we find anything in this quite large material, and we can also pool it with the TTM1 trial, if we find subgroups within this material, we haven't so far, but if we find subgroups, of course we will concentrate uh, resources and to do trials on that group. Uh, but um, so far, this group has not been identified. Um, so TTM3, fever, is it good for you or is it bad for you? Thanks a lot, Nicholas. Uh, and uh, thanks for, for being with us today. And of course, congratulations again to you, to the Loon group and the whole TTM group for these great results and the contribution to advancing in uh, care of cardiac arrest patients. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's uh, really nice to, to acknowledge the full group, the international group, because I think this is the route forward. If we can combine forces, we will be able to answer the important questions. Thank bye you. Bye-bye, Nicholas. Bye-bye.